Is it three weeks? No, no, like two thirds of the next week following. I'll leave that next Thursday, so July fifth. Like the day after July fourth. I'll be like six a.m. Oh Jeez. man. You ready? Well, that's good. Yes, we're gonna be. Well, it's already alive. We already started. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Hello, everybody, out there in R and R land. Do we have who's on or who's going to um, Valeria? Valeria, when the questions come on, let us know. You'll be reading them out. Yeah. So as you can see, Adrian's not here. So when Adrian's not here, things just kind of go here and go there and whatever. We're going to try to corral kittens and what have yeah. you. So, yeah, it's a lot of chaotic. Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we are expecting Adrian back, um, I guess, when? Today. Tonight? Tonight, yeah. Oh, that's cool. So he's coming back from? Uh, or uh, Orlando. Back in Orlando. That's cool. Wow, wow. So you went on a job type of thing? Pretty much. Nice job. Sounds like a vacation. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Well, okay, well, we've got an oldie buddy goodie. He's back. What's up? <laughs> if you all don't remember, so sometime back, um, there was a period of time there, would you say, about a year ago maybe? Yeah. So about a year ago, um, this young man to my left was very involved in his high school, and um, a lot of children would come over, and I shouldn't say children, a lot of young adults yeah. would come over <laughs> and um, participate in R&R, &R, and it was such a big blessing. Um, the church was further blessed when he decided to go where? To Walla Walla University. And Walla Walla, and to do what? To study theology. And become a what? Pastor. Boom, there it is. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? And, um, just so that you know, we've got um, people in the background, pastors back there, Josiah, Haley, and Valeria back there. Valeria decided she didn't want to be up here today, so she went Elias ahead and Elias. sat down. Yeah, it's Elias, I'm Josiah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I said Josiah? Okay, I'm sorry about that, Josiah. Elias is back there. So, um... It's good to have you back, man. Thank you. It's good to be back. How do you how, how tell us? Tell what did you th what you think? It I was, mean, it was a journey. <laughs> um, it was definitely a lot of a lot of adjusting <laughs> and a lot of failure and a lot of successes mm. as well. So it was one for the books. Good deal. So how does this work? Okay, so you're going to be your is this like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior kind of? Yes, sir. And then. And then after that, you get your bachelor's, and then you move on to... So I'll be... Um, normally, the plan is, after my bachelor's, I'll become an associate pastor. Awesome. And then uh, after a while, once they see I'm ready, then they'll send me to master's in Andrews. In Andrews. And then you apply and... and then that's where the wind takes me, where God guides the wind to take me. So. <laughs> and so you've gotten over your first year. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Pastor Tarbox, what year would you say is the hardest? Um, soft, whatever year you got to do Greek. Greek. Yeah. So, <laughs> you got to do Greek. Next Greek. year. Yeah. Yeah. Sophomore. Year is the one you got to do Hebrew. In, so. <laughs> well, it's usually sophomore, junior year. Yeah. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Greek just, doesn't seem that bad. Just, what's that? Greek doesn't seem that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from somebody who can barely speak Spanish. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to just shut up. Shut yes. <laughs> so, and to my, <laughs> well, good to have you back, Joshua. Have, I mean, Josh, good to have you back. And to my left, say your name, say hi. I'm Ernesto. <laughs> just Ernesto. I'm back after a few months from the last time I was here. Been a few months. Maybe a year. No, I don't think that long. We did Judges with Samson last... That's right. September. Judges with Samson. Yeah, so you were here back then, back in a bit. And to my right? Oh, I'm um, David. He's still waking up. <laughs> I rushed home and he was barely waking up. <laughs> I'm telling you. And, last but not least, Josiah. what? Not Elias. Yeah, not Elias. Nope. Josiah. Not Tolan. Well, it's good to have you all here. So, um... I guess we can begin really quickly. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, just talk about prayers and praises, and, and we'll start with you, and we'll go around this way. Um, praise that. <laughs> Almost done high school. One more year left. Yes. Pray for Isaac. I haven't heard from him for maybe like a 
month or so. Okay. So I'll pray for him. Isaac, your older brother? Yes. Okay. David? Um, for friends and family. Good deal. Like think of that. For friends and family? Well, that friends and family are important. And um, I just want to uh, raise my wife and David up. Um, they are. They will be leaving um, uh, on a trip tomorrow in, into Mexico. So uh, just you know, keep them in prayer that they go and they return safely. Um, it's a big family uh, reunion that they have every single year. And yeah, yeah my wife and I, we've been married 25 plus years, and I've probably met half of her family. They're just everywhere. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. So <laughs> keep them in prayer. Your family's big? Good deal. Prayer or praise? Um, I pray that my dad doesn't have so much jet lag because I know the babies are going to be all like all chaos. So pray for him. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah, he gets, he gets back here tonight. So. Yeah, I mean, jet lag shouldn't be too bad. That's what, a four hour, five hour flight? He'll be all right. He'll be Not fine. For me. It'll be fine. Well, yeah, you, yeah, cross the pond. <laughs> um, I would praise just to be back and see you guys. Also, be done with my freshman year. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and then a prayer request just for God to like keep holding on to me through His journey while I learn things and become adjusted to a new life. So awesome. Good deal. Good deal. And for those of you who are not aware. This gentleman to my left will be preaching this Sabbath, so please come pack the pews, pack the rafters, and um, and uh, I still remember your your Moses sermon, the five minute one. Oh, that was funny. <laughs> it was great. It got to the it point, was, and straight to the point. <laughs> it was straight to the point. I still remember it. It's a good deal. So yes, as we tend to have this, uh, we go with tradition. Yes, sir. Go ahead and start us in prayer. Yes, sir. It's in our heads. Father God, thank you for another opportunity to come together. Thank you for another day, another blessing. I ask that you please be with this study, um, that you guide our minds and our thoughts and our words as we speak together and just conversate over your word, Father God, that you have given to us. Um, you hear our hearts. You've heard our prayers and praises, Father God. I ask that you please be with us. Give us peace of mind, peace of heart um, as we go through these journeys of our lives, Father God. And you keep our prayers and praises in your mind, Father. Thank you for all that you do. In the name of the Lord, we all pray. Amen. And amen. amen. If I could just remind you to let me know who's on or, or what, and then we'll... Is Tony on, or...? Well, there's no one here yet. Okay, good deal. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. Let me know when they're on. Um, we are doing Hebrews 10. Yes, sir. Hebrews 10. So in looking through it and reading through it, um, there's quite a bit to unravel. But, you know, I've noticed that about the entire book so far of Hebrews. Um, it, it's just jam-packed with, um, with Christ and with Jesus in it and, and, and what he meant of times of old and what he means to times of today and what he is to uh, reveal to us in the future. So Hebrews is jam-packed every single chapter, even the smaller ones. Um, this one is really rather lengthy one, so we're going to dive right into it. Uh, and I hope we can get through it really quickly. Um, but before we begin that, let's just go ahead and give a real quick recap. Who was here last week? Pastor? And what do you, what could you say? And I'm not sure if the mic can pick you up, but um, what, what do you remember about Hebrews 9? <laughs> oh, it's about the shadow and uh, basically the priestly ministry of what Jesus Christ is actually doing uh, and how the, the shadow was with the earthly temple, but now Jesus Christ is ministering in the heavenly temple and is now fulfilling all the different aspects of what the earthly tabernacle represented. And in doing so, he is now showing why he is the better priest in the order of Melchizedek because his blood is a blood that, that is sufficient to cover and also to tear the veil uh, so that we have access to the Father. That was a huge thing is that the veil has been torn and we now have access to the Father. So that was the big, big key points. So, so in a nutshell, it was um, really deciphering between the old and the new, wherein Christ has become the better priest he is now the better priest, and our access to the heavenly tabernacle, as you said, from the earthly tabernacle, uh, was torn. And so 
there's where we're at at the end of chapter 9, and we are to begin chapter 10 on those grounds. So if we can go ahead and start with you, Mr. Josh. Um, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worship, for the worshipers, once purified, would have no consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of the bulls and the goats should take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of a book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, lo mm -hmm. I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Okay, let's go ahead and stop there. Uh, one through nine. What are some of the things that you've noticed through here? Or what is one of the bigger, um, I, I guess, what have we determined as of now from one through nine? What are we seeing? Josh. Yeah, so one of the main things that are really pointed out here is the difference between the sacrifices and where we are now. So... Um, this, I believe Hebrews is written to uh, the Jewish people who were trying to bring back like the laws and the sacrifices and the importance of doing so. Whereas God is telling them like, no, like you no longer have to sacrifice and abide by the laws. Rather you are justified through your belief in me and through what you know um, and believe in now rather than what you do. You know what I'm saying? I love it. Context. I love it. Ernesto? From what... Uh I've read um, kind of like what Josh is saying, difference between sacrifice and it now. Um, it's talking about, I, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but it's with, it's with sacrifices. Okay, and so with sacrifices, Josh, you had mentioned something interesting. Uh, the Hebrews were attempting to do what? So they were trying to, like, bring back the idea that you were justified through your works and through fulfilling the law, which is the way that they used to live, uh, according to, like, the Old Testament. But now, since the uh, sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it's kind of changed. And so why would anybody want to bring back those old ways? What, what do you think about that, Josiah? Why would anyone want to bring back those old customs? Um, like the Jewish, like you can't walk like a couple feet in that. I don't think so, but like I think they're talking about like the Ten Commandments and that. Okay. Like back then, uh, how like, you got to do this and this and this. But I, I don't think they're talking about you know like, you can't pick up your mat in that. Okay. And those, those rules, but they are, like that God's the Ten Commandments. That's what I think you want to bring back. Well, well, even that, you know, we're talking already a few hundred years or what have you. But why, why do you think? Why do you suspect? A, a, a group of people who have already been exposed to Christ already in his sacrifice, what would be the intent or, or the reasoning behind bringing old old customs back, old laws, old, um, I don't want to say old laws, but, but the, the past? Why bring that up? Because it's comfortable. Comfortable? They've done it over and over. They know how it works. Very interesting. So maybe comfort is control? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. I think, um, like, it started off, especially, like, the Jews were, they are supposed to be, like, the, the carriers of the word, the word to the world. So, like, they started as, like, God's people, and now it's kind of become so widespread that I think they feel, like, kind of, like, it's no longer them. You know what I'm saying? There may be a sense of, like, losing their identity mm. in a sense and where they feel like, oh, now we're diluted into everybody else and we're not really exclusive. There's nothing really so special about it anymore. That's a very good. I mean, that's a very good good, good analysis. You were going to say something, Pastor. So, no. Okay. So it's like they're kind of losing their social status. Yeah, in a way that could be. Uh, they're like 
it's kind of they want like you said a way of controlling a way of asserting like who we are we are the Jews we are the like children of God like this is who we are and like if you don't like go to our ways and you can't be a part of us you know kind of things that keep their exclusivity well so so herein now because of that we have the writer here telling us that Christ has now offered something different and so we see it in chapter or verse one um, I, I was able to and I don't know about you if you agree or maybe you see this maybe you don't maybe you see uh, more in this but um, I was able to see three different things in chapter in verse one rather um, a shadow an image and something to come mm-hmm. and so what do you all think about shadows they block light coming from the original figure okay so blocking the light in, in a sense of like um like like that light's kind of bright on us kind of do this right and so um what would you see on my if you could see it defined well what would you normally see if i do this a shadow and what would the shadow be your head right so talk to me about that what do you think a shadow is um i think it's a representation of someone's footsteps yeah something to come something to expect because you can't really tell the full picture in a shadow but you can kind of depict what it may be and what it cost you could expect for it you know what i'm saying yes so shadow is kind of like a precursor of something that's coming along the way. Yeah. But in that sense, you would have to have the source of light behind whatever it is that gives off the shadow, right? So I think that's another another thing that we need, we'll, we'll talk about shortly. But um, what about the image? What do you take of that? It says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect so it's it's telling about three things and referring it or relating it to the people who are affected by it correct which would be those offering sacrifices or what have you those who are looking for the atonement of sin, correct? So if they've got a shadow, would you say that that's even, uh, what's a good word, what's a good way of looking at it? Would you say that's kind of even as, as important as the image itself? Um, I would say it's, it's, a, it's definitely like important. I don't know if I would say it's as important as the image because the image is a clear version of the shadow. So like, I think it's like a segue, like it leads up to rather than like a scale of like importance. It's just like revealing more and more to you. So it shows an outline of an image, mm-hmm. right? How about the image itself? What do you think about the image? Is it as as weighty as the actual thing that produces the image, if that makes sense? Mm-hmm. So like in contrast of like the image and then the light that's showing the image or? So can an image cast light or Uh, cast a shadow yes Yes. depends on how the image is formed correct Mm -hmm. and so what i picked up off of this is i think it goes even further than that the good things to come is obviously something that the image is in and of itself reflecting so the image is probably not as detailed as that which is to come Mm. correct i hear you so when I saw that, I kind of read those three things. I don't know if I'm stretching it. Pastor, what do you think? I know you're back there, but. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, it, to me, it's, it's, it's hitting on, this again, the sacrifices. This, that's mm-hmm. the context of this. And it's saying, and it's trying to point to the context of these sacrifices that you're trying to bring back, trying to use as a way of trying to uh, have a hold on your own salvation, your own righteousness, mm-hmm. they're not enough. It's been done away with because these things, these shadows, when you see a shadow, it's saying, oh, there's an image. So I look at that image, and that image tells me what it accomplishes, but it accomplishes only enough with that shadow. So I need the real thing, and that real thing was Jesus. So when Jesus died and came and was the sacrifice that was enough that was explained in the previous chapter, he's saying if if that was enough, then anything we do after, we go back to the old ways, like, we're just wasting our time. Right. This is useless. And and so, but he's pointing also to the ministry of Jesus saying, well, what is Jesus then doing if he is enough? 
And I think that's where it kind of leads into a little bit. So Pastor has brought us to um, uh, full circle when it comes to what the focus here is. And that is what? That Jesus. Is what? Jesus is the, the image. He's the one, the true. Correct. Gives off the image. But again, that whole word that we're looking at here, and again, the reason why they wanted redemption, the Hebrews and all this, is because, well, they're sinful. And so we're bringing back, or we're actually focusing on now, what's to come, and that is Christ. Christ uh, completed that. His was the sacrifice. Um, has anybody logged on? Or? Okay, so it's a little bit slow today, but that's okay. That's all right. Um, anything else that you see through here? Can any of these sacrifices that they want to re- reboot bring back these physical sacrifices pastor uh so not along the lines of just the physical sacrifices but mm -hmm. now just like with uh how jesus went further on the temple mount sermon of uh you said it you said it that you know um if you if you you know kill someone that you you know you commit a murder but that's you know happened in your mind correct previous to that is to me that's it's saying the same thing in a different way it's saying hey you think sacrifices is killing these animals and and it's by this blood well, I'm telling you the blood of Jesus was enough, but now the sacrifices that's being asked of you is of obedience mm -hmm. and of character change now. And so he's, he's doing that next step and saying, like, we're still to offer sacrifice, but now he's hinting on what a living sacrifice is, mm -hmm. right? And, and, he, and he's kind of connecting this. And, and also, Hebrews' his thoughts have been written by Paul. Correct. So you can kind of see that imagery where Word. he's bringing that in. But he's trying to take it a step further with saying, okay, now how do, how do we still live out for Christ? How do we, how do we still act as, as the priesthood of all believers? And what does a sacrifice look like in this context? And he, he kind of hits it on because he's pointing to Jesus as how his sacrifice was in obedience and keeping God, God's commandments in his heart and living them out. So it's not an issue of them ceasing this sacrifice. It's really focusing on what was the ministry of Christ and how it established the new sacrifice. And, and, and it is one to call upon obedience to, to this chapter. Now, this is such a, it, it's a big chapter in that um, it, it's, it, it's clearly defining to us what, what and how we should, I guess, carry forth with this um, as far as, as, as sacrifices go, um, sacrifice the image is not sufficient. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never be, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sacrificed. But the Holy Spirit also witnessing to us for after he had said before. This is the covenant um, I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and their, and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where remissions of, the, of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, bloodless, blood, bloodless, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Okay, let's go ahead and stop there. So we've established sacrifice, old, new, image, shadow, things to come, Christ, you name it. What do we find here in these next chapter, these next verses? Um, what stands out to you? One of the biggest things that stands out to me is like they're like establishing the power of Jesus now. They're mm -hmm. like showing how powerful he is compared to these sacrifices, whereas they took sacrifices year after year to to um, atone their sins like one by one. Rather, now there's this one man who sacrificed himself, and now the sins are atoned for eternity. And that really that really like stuck out to me um, in a powerful way. So. so who who is this man? Uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ. So I, I guess I have a question for you all. Do you ever find yourselves, um, and you look at this, thinking to yourself that anything you do or anything you can do 
can make up for sins? I mean, think about it this way. Do you all still continue to sin? Yes. yes. Okay. Oh, do. We all do, correct? And so with that being said, what do you find to be the best way to atone for the sin? That meant, think about that for a second. Um, I think sometimes when I like mess up, I try to like undo the mess up and then do a good deed to make up for it. Mm. Um, that seems to be like a common trend that I find myself running into. And so does the, the all right, well, what, what do you do? Pretty the same thing, yeah. Kind of trying to make up for it, right? Mm-hmm. So if you do make up for it, does it necessarily make up for the person the harm was done against, maybe? Mm-hmm. Or what does it really do? Just make yourself feel better. Makes yourself feel better, huh? And so I guess sometimes, what are you going to say, dude? Are you going to say anything? Oh, I just pray about it, and then I just try to fix it. Mm. And, and when you try to fix it, how are you going about it? I just try to make sure the other person is understanding. Not of what I did, but of their own. And so... Go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead. And so when we try to do those things, you know, does that fly in the face of us understanding that these things are, this atonement has already been completed? Um... And what, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by that? And I, and I see that it says here, um, it says here, but that this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, and it says forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from whence forth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And then this is very, very important here. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. What do y'all think about that verse? What does that mean to you? That's verse 14. Does somebody have a different version? Uh, uh, New King James. Go ahead and read it. Uh, what was it? 12 and 13? 14. Read 14. All right. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. What does that mean to you? Like once, once someone or something has been sanctified, he has perfected, perfected, them and well forever and so who is this perfection being offered to it says it right there for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified so now to me this brings up the question like how do i achieve sanctification like this is something i want so that's the the first thing that automatically comes to my head is like how do i achieve that how do you achieve it First of all, what is sanctification? What is sanctification? What's the word sanctified? When, when you see something is sanctified. And, and you, know, being, you, you know where we're coming from with this. You know, we, we, we listen to things like um, we understand the Sabbath has been sanctified. You know, that type of thing. So you're all familiar with that word. I know you've heard it before. What does sanctified mean? Um, to be made apart. Like, to be... Um, yeah. Pastor? I got you. I got you. Yeah, you're you're good is, there, yes. This is good Christian jargon lingo. That, good Christian uh, lingo, yes. This is hard because uh, sometimes we can say these things and people that aren't Christians are going to be like, bro, what are you talking about? Right. Like sanctification. The, the best term that I've ever heard that I use for myself is sanctification is becoming more like Jesus. Mm-hmm. Simple. It's just becoming more like Jesus. Um, and... It's not here, but I would say the way through that is through connection. You know, Jesus said, I am the, I am the vine, you are the branch. You know, apart from me, you, you can do nothing, and, you, and you're dead. You know what I mean? And so it's like, how do I become more like Jesus? Jesus also gave us the framework when he was uh, calling James and John. He said, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Right. So it's like, he says, you, I, you already belong to me. I want you. We just have that relationship with him, that connection, prayer through the word. And in doing so, just being in a relationship with him, we start becoming more like him. We can't help it. That is a great, great point. So then I've got another question. So we understand then, then, and, and, and as Pastor has put it, 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 is, it is being set apart and becoming more like Christ. So that's a good way of putting this. Because what if a person who is not a Christian or a person who's... A, Baby Christian, brand new, brand new to the faith, 
Yes. <laughs> Trying to figure it out. Maybe has doubts. Maybe disagrees with some of this. And we read something like this. Wouldn't it be easy for us to say, oh, for by one offering, which is his sacrifice, that forever to be offered to them yeah. that are already part of the group? Yeah. So it's closed off then. That's only right. a certain amount of people can go and only a certain type of people can go and that's it. Is that what this is telling us? Or is what Pastor's saying, because I, I agree with Pastor, this kind of opens it up for even those of us who are still struggling yeah. with sin, correct? What, what, is, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I believe sanctification is offered to everyone. Um, famous John 3, 16, that he died for all the world, preservably things shall not perish, but live a rest in life. Um, he didn't die for just a sect of people or a certain culture. He died for everyone. So I think just reading this verse alone without much context can be very deceiving. Mm. But understanding and reading more and as you dive into the Word, you'll realize that Jesus was a very, very impartial man. Like He died for every single person. So it's a, it's a choice. It's a it's up to you to accept that sanctification and to go through that journey with him. So if just one person in the past 2,000 some years accepted his sacrifice, would that have been enough? If just one person, the one person from the billions and trillions of people that have existed in the past 2,000 years, one person accepted his sacrifice, was it good enough then? Mm. Absolutely. So Christ died for not just one, but for all, all who will accept. And so I love how Pastor said that. Sanctification really points to those of us, I use that term generally, who are continually trying to become more like Christ more like Jesus. And 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 I, I guess it doesn't matter where you are in that walk, so long as you're focusing on becoming more like him. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and well even even if you are focusing in on him, mm -hmm. the big thing that verse fourteen is hitting on is it when it says, For by one sacrifice that he has made perfect so then it's not on my perfection. Perfect. It's not on it, it, it's not even on me trying. It's on the fact that I'm just with him. Right. It's it's because of him. It's this whole this whole chapter, this whole book is hitting on his look. Jesus Christ is that answer. But why is he that answer? Right? It's because of his blood. It's because of his sacrifice. It's because he has now achieved the, the fulfillment of everything that came before. And so now it's not on it's not in my strength. It's not by my works. But yet I still want to become because not not because of I will gain the love of Christ, but, but because I was first loved, or I love because I was first loved by Christ. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So it's a huge it's a huge shift, and it's amazing because then it it takes the burden off my shoulders. It's not it's not on me to be cut, to be changed. It's on me to allow to be changed. So the perfection isn't weaved by our own will or by our own design. It is. It is meant for us to accept it as he wills and as he designs. Re Revelation gives us the illustration. Correct. Oh, I knock on the door of your heart. Yes. Wishing to, that it would be open so I can dine with you. Think about that. That's such an intimate uh, illustration. He wants to have a relationship like, like one does with a best friend or uh, a lover, but not in a sexual way, in a way right. that's just yeah, a heart to heart, a soul to soul. You know? and, and in saying that, verse 14, and, and this is something that I struggled when I had read this, to me, it kind of reveals what free will is. You know, I don't have to open that door. Or I could choose to open the door and allow him in my, in my in, 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 in the doorway, and, and that's it, and ask him to leave, you know? Again, um, I think 14 really points towards free will and how, 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 how he, he's allowed us to accept him as or not to accept him as that sacrifice. Let's go ahead and move on. I think we're running a little bit late, but um, we're at 20. Who did we leave off on? Go for it. By a new and living way, which he considered for us through the, through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Um, for he is faithful that, that promised. 
And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good work. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, <clears throat> as is the manner of some, but ex exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. But a certain fearful expectation, expectation of judgment and a fire, fiery indication which will devour the adversaries. Okay, let's stop there real quickly. Um, any verse in here kind of jump out at any of you? Mm, um, what was it? Right here. Verse verse 25, near, mm. near, the, near the end of verse 25. Mm -hmm. and, so much, and, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And day is capitalized, so I'm, I believe that's the second coming. Mm. Yeah. And, and look at the very beginning of that verse. What does it read? Not forsaking what? The assembling, assembling of ourselves. Together. Yes. As a manner of some is. So some are already forsaking that, correct? Mm -hmm. what, is, what does verse 25 mean to you? Um, to me, it kind of just shows the importance to me of like, sticking together and staying mended um i think it like really stands true i've learned a lot recently that like you become like the three most the, pe the people you hang out with the most the three closest to your circle and i think like by us hanging out together being together as a church family like spending more time together staying interlocked like we become more and more like christ because in the end run that's what we're striving for and so i think he's honing in on that importance of that relationship within the church and with the family so you can build and grow upon one another. So is it important then that we gather? Yes. And, and saying that, why? Why is it important that we gather? Because iron sharpens iron. Oh, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Iron sharpens iron. And what does that mean to you? That those who are faithful and those who know God will then help others to be like God. And that makes sense. Right. It kind of it, 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 it if Josiah shows up to church and he's consistently uh, not feeling it, whatever that might be, just not interested in going. Would it be important for him to continue doing so? Yes. And if he stops, what would, what would then our responsibility be? To go get him. To go find him, correct? And and that's important. And why is that important? Because it. It like bonds us together. If that makes sense. Yes. Does I? Yep. Um, I think like your the walk with God is very, very to a lot of people very fragile. Um, it's something that that's very personal and it's very vulnerable, and it's something that like can easily be you can be shied away from and scared from. And I think having that support, having that that backbone when you're feeling shying away from like your relationship with God you're feeling like it's not helping you like you're not getting anything in return I think that backbone really brings you back and allows you to have somebody to fall on to mm. because this walk isn't meant to be like walked by ourselves you know it's meant to be a band of people like coming together to to literally what a family is like to be for there for one another when you're going through it and with that being said, there was another word in here, and I was trying to look for it as, you, as we were talking, but the word boldness. Mm. So it, it talks about boldness in here as well, and then it moves into the, the assembly of, of, of the body of Christ, of all of us getting together and gathering with one another. Verse 19. Verse 19, what does it say? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So as we are to enter into that communion, you know, that communion in which the blood of Jesus is established, and we understand where that's going. But I have, a, I have a bigger question for you then. As brethren, I don't want to say brothers because brothers and sisters, you know, we're all brethren. In this community we call church. You know, you might want to think of it as the four walls, you know, you may not. What, however, the thing we call church. Is it important that we enter into this blood of Christ with boldness? Is it important as brothers, as brethren, to enter into this community with a sense of boldness? Yes. yes. And, and in order to be bold, 
you play baseball. You guys in baseball. <laughs> if you didn't know the position, if you didn't know what you were doing, would you be bold out there? No. 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 <laughs> so what do you do to get bold out there? What do you get? How do you how do you play a position, and and play it well? So getting comfortable. Yeah, you you. First off, you spend a lot of time out there. <laughs> right. Um, and then also the big thing that coaches, like, they'll hone on is communicating, like mm -hmm. making sure we're all mm -hmm. on the same page, talking to each other, making sure. Because, like, there will be plays where you can't see behind you, but you're catching a ball, and the only, the only way you'll know where to throw is because your teammates are yelling at you, like, oh, go to third, throw to first, whatever the case may be. So that communication is really heavy and really <laughs> important. So is that important in church? I mean, uh, put all of those things that, that you just said when you're out in the field, put all that in the, in the church. Yeah. And why is that important? Why is it important that we all communicate with one another? Um, I think it's important that we communicate Josiah. Josiah? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what, well, like you and I were talking about when I, when I did my first sermon and how mm -hmm. I to tell everyone what, what I'm doing, that's it. It's uh, about on that. And so there's like no surprises, and just say if I say something wrong, mm -hmm. then other people can like correct me in that. But you need to like, how can I say it? Like, like being bold, like knowing what to do in that, and what is wrong, what's right, what you should do, what what you should not to do in that. So in being bold, does when when one is bold and they're in church, does that necessarily mean that they know everything? No. So would you agree that being bold also means accepting criticism or being taught yes. Yes. is important? So learning, I mean, you might say something that might not be theologically or accurate or what have you when you're up on, on the pulpit, you know, if that if that is ever the case. And, and if it's brought to your attention, how do you react to something like that? How would you? Me? I'll be calm in that. I, I would I want to learn more. Okay. If I said something wrong, I would like to like learn more of like, what I said wrong and what's the right answer. In that. So what does all this mean then? So then we're entering and we are assembling and we're not trying to forsake, uh, forsake the body of Christ. And, and we're going into it with boldness for the benefit, like you all said, sharpening iron, sharpening iron, uh, for the benefit of others, uh, other people in church that may not be where, where we're at and what have you. Um, what about members that don't want to participate, that just kind of want to come in, sit down, and leave? Is that okay, too? Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. And so what would you tell somebody who says, I don't want to participate or anything, I just want to come and listen? That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Would you encourage anything beyond that? Of course. Yeah. What would you encourage? Small things like green or just hanging out food. Okay, smaller, because not everybody can get up there and, you know, or not everybody wants to get up there and give a sermon, or sometimes people are comfortable turning on the lights, opening the doors, locking the doors, making certain that the sanctuary, everything is, you know, up and running, or have you, those are that type of thing. But um, you do realize then that it is extremely important, as they are speaking here, um, that as we enter in, into boldness with this, and, 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 and there's a lot more to bolding, to bolding, to being bold and, and what this is really referring to. But what I really wanted to concentrate was the, the assembling of, 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 of us in church and how important it is. Did, did any of you say anything else beyond that? Pastor, anything? Yeah, um, I think it's interesting that before the assembly, mm -hmm. before assembling, before spurring one another yes. on, it, revol it involves a personal relationship with God, meaning that you don't necessarily need to, and I think I've seen this as a pastor in my first year, is that people come to church thinking that just kind of by rubbing shoulders that that will get me to have faith. But even though faith can be contagious, it still comes back to a personal choice. Right. And and what, what I see here in uh, 22 is that we've been provided this way a personal way for each and every single one of us. And in doing so, we come with a sincere heart and assurance based on what Jesus has done. And in doing so, when we come to the Assembly of the Saints, we are now reinforcing what has happened personally. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. But sometimes so, we go to the Assembly thinking that just by being in the Assembly, that will help us to do personally, when it's only when we go to Jesus that that happens. So in it, words, it can happen, yes, but it's also... 
it still comes back to a personal thing too. So kind of like um, joining and hopefully you know being in church and you know maybe they rub off on me type of thing. So it is important then, from what I'm understanding then, that we establish that personal relationship with Christ, not just going to church and hoping others' faith rubs off on us. Again, like being in sports, one thing is to join the team and hope that all the other superstars' gifts and talents rub off on you, or you get there and you practice getting personally closer to what it is that you need to establish there. Yes? Um, verse 24 and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good work. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminded me of what you just said, yeah. on how we have, on how we have to help others find their way. Like yeah. you know what I mean? Provoke them. So what does yeah, provoke mean? What does like provoke? To push. Mm -hmm. To push them to do good work. To push them to good work. Nudge them maybe a little bit. Kind of like um, when we say, Haley, you're going to be doing the next. One or something like a little nudge here and there, right? Because I'll, I'm going to tell you something. I remember the, one of the very first times I ever met Haley. I, I remember I looked at her and I said, hey, I want you to do something one time or whatever. And I know she's probably looking at me really mean right now, but that's okay. And she, I'm never going to do it. Never. Don't even look at me. Now, it looks like we even got her maybe singing the Sabbath or something, right? Or something's going to happen. But I'm telling you right now, little nudges. You're absolutely correct. Little nudges. That little provocation. The little poking. Absolutely. And you never know what, what type of talent or what type of uh, who is, is is sitting down in those pews sometimes. And, and that's why, you know, I always look forward to the, the, the elections and all this. And when, you know, when, when people are, because, I mean, there's just so much talent there. When you have a church that grows, imagine that much more talent that just we just don't know mm -hmm. that's there. And it's just a wonderful, beautiful time when we can see that. Yeah. I, I'd like to say yes. a little A little recap on... The example with David and Josiah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, near, when when you said it, uh, I thought of something where it was all like David, being the pathfinder he is, mm -hmm. or used to be. I don't know. Well, <laughs> on, but but he could lead Josiah on that path to God, and then God can finish the rest. Right, and so, you know, that's a good point you brought up. That's a very good point you brought up because this year we had two TLTs, which um, in just them doing what they were doing, I'm hoping those that are coming up, and I know one is laughing at me right now and the other one is just kind of staring, that somehow they're going to come on and do things a lot better. I'm not trying to say that they're going to be better than the both of you. You guys did a great and wonderful job. You guys are going to go on to year two. But this program is developing and the nudging you did is going to be clear when the next round comes in and i'm thinking they're going to nudge the next group and they're going to even be better this is going to be such a great program and again we're not forsaking the assembly of god with us you're nudging them this is with boldness that you guys did this to get up there and and do what you guys i mean that's really really um it's wonderful. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, beginning, I guess, 29 or... 28. 28. Um, where do we leave off? You go ahead. Go ahead. Ernesto. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law, law will, dies without mercy, without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And how much... Okay, okay. Sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will rate, recomp recomp recompense. Recompense. Saith that the Lord, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the, received the light, when you endured in great conflict full of suffering. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reapproaches and, tri and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those 
who were so treated. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Wow. Cast not away, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recon, recompense, recompense, recompense of reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Now the, the just shall live by faith, but if anybody draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believeth to the saving of the soul. Uh, guys, this was jam-packed. Those last ten or so were just jam-packed with... <laughs> I mean, we, I, I truly feel sometimes you know, I'm, I'm doing an injustice by kind of going through this that way, but, man, I'm looking at some of those things, and I'm just saying to myself, those are, death, those are jam-packed with just hours of studying of what Christ is about. But but because of time frame, it, you know, we have now looked at the beginning of Hebrews 10, which was what? Establishing what? What did the beginning, the first part that we talked about, what did it do? Um, well, that comes a little bit later. That we are no longer justified by our works and our sacrifices. That the ministry of Christ is now existing and what? Has perfected that. Right? Yes. Correct. And so... It's no longer the image, and it's no longer the shadow that was casted that was important. It's now the fulfillment of his ministry. And then we moved on to the second part, and what was that about? I think that one was boldness. Boldness of what? Of, I believe, ourselves. You are going to say? Um, boldness of just our faith and boldness in nudging one another and mm -hmm. assembling together for the Lord. Knowing that... Christ's sacrifice yeah, is sufficient. And, and going back to that one verse that says what? <clears throat> for that one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Giving us now the boldness to say, hey, it's done. We're good. Let's move on and show this to others. But now we're getting into some of the last part here. <laughs> that, that did, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> So now we're in the last part here, which is talking about what? What does this last part talk about? Um, I think this one's talking about, like, he's telling us that the walk is going to be hard and that we will be, like, ridiculed and we will experience, like, some some sort of, like, traumatic I don't know. Experience. Yeah, ex yeah, some sort of traumatic experience and that uh, we are called to just continue with our walk and stay head first and keep our eyes on the light. What do you think? Mm. Kind of like what Josh said, um, um, there, the path is going to be hard, but if you go through it, it's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, going off what they were saying, like, the path is going to be hard on that, but we need to have faith in order to continue and see, th uh, see through the end. See through it through the end. Mm -hmm. well, that's going to be a difficult thing, is it? Yes and no. Okay. If you have faith, then it'd be a lot easier. Anything to add to that? Um, that I don't. I got it in my mind right now. Um, that even though no, that we should learn to have bonds with each other, learn to be connected learn to push each other and that'll help us carry through correct and isn't there a danger in here as well it's kind of an, an admonition in here admonition basically is like a warning mm -hmm. and it's in here as well because that is exactly the message he's trying to tell everybody but then he also says what about the rejection those that don't want to carry it through the end or those that may not be bold enough those that might not be strong enough but what about the rejection of the sacrifice what of it um, but they don't, they just simply don't belong, they, they're not, that's not what we stand for, you know, kind of what we do. However, like, as much as, like, you know, not that you don't completely belong, like, it's it's tricky because the walk with God is one that, like, you you could find yourself leaving, but at any time with open arms, you can come back to. So it's like, 
yeah, you're not a part of it. Like you're not a part of this, this, this. Um, I don't know. I don't want to say anything that's like kind of like. <laughs> Say it, that's fine. Right. I'll give an alley to Mr. Turbox. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, so, what is your take? So basically, it's, it's, it's along with what you're saying, bro, but it's also the fact that with, with what's going on, is it's a full knowledge. Like, he mentions that this person, this person's being sanctified, right? This person has come into full knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done, has, has started being changed by the Holy Spirit, and then this is, to me, where we see the unpardonable sin. And, and people say, there's a sin that's unpardonable? Yes, because mm -hmm. if you reject, or as it's, it says in the scripture, if you trample on the body of Jesus and what he's done, you are cutting yourself off from the only thing that will save you. Right. So you are, and that's why it says in the, in the preceding verse, it's like, uh, anyone who drinks, uh, wait, hold on. Uh, but the, it's a, the only thing that you have left is to be judged. Like, you have nothing left. Like, you basically seal yourself because you understood the truth. You knew, what, like, you knew what God had done for you. And you said, you know what? This is an evil thing. Right. This isn't, I don't want this. You, you make it active. And that's hard because God knows our heart and knows that. <laughs> but that's why there was the, we have the, the reverse comparison, that we draw close with a sincere heart. Right? But right. Then we can also sincerely reject the Lord, knowing full well everything he's revealed to us. And in doing so, we, we really sign our death warrant. You know what I mean? And so it's, it's amazing because it's, it, it goes back to that choice. Right. It goes back to that choice. Am I going to allow God to work on me, to change me, or am I going to reject him outright as he shows me more truth? And in doing so, I'm, I, have no, I, know, I have no hope. And, and what a wonderful and blessed and beautiful God that has given us the ability to choose that. All right? So with that being said, he calls on us to remind us not to reject, not to be um, so easily and readily of, you know, available to those that want to destroy us or, or inhibit us or prevent us from assembling together and what have you, but to keep that faith and to keep it going because as Pastor said, that is what we've got left. Once that's done you've committed either you've allowed him in to dine with you or you've rejected him at the door so um i certainly am, am, am very happy that we went through this it was a long chapter um a lot to unravel here a lot to go through and what have you but um i think we did it and uh, you know uh, next week we're hopefully your dad will be back your dad will be back and um josh will be here again next week um, maybe 50 50 50 50 pastor 64. next week it should be all right all right and um Haley just keeps giving me that dirty side eye but that's okay <laughs> that's all right <laughs> you'll be doing it soon Haley <laughs> so um I guess with that uh we're gonna go ahead and uh, close up with this and um if I can have Mr. Ernesto you're also in here if we can go can close this in prayer please Thank you, Jesus, for this day, and thank you for Josh coming back, and thank you for the prayers and praises, and those that were not mentioned but were mentioned in the mind, please let them let them happen, or something like that. I don't know how to explain it, and I just I just hope everybody will be good for the next one and that from hearing this chapter we can all be committed so we can have a good time with you and everybody else Jesus Christ and we pray Amen. Amen. Amen All right. so with that God bless you all and we will see you next week Bye bye